alien entities, what are they? What does that mean? In this series of teachings, Dr. Lester Sumrall talks about the spiritual aspects of people with multiple personalities and those plagued with clinical depression. He also shares how the church should have the answers to any human problem, including alien entities. Stay tuned for this fascinating series that teaches people how Jesus Christ can set people free. prosper dealing with the most important subject that we could teach you from the Word, in that until you know how uh, to defeat the enemy, uh, you cannot be a successful and victorious soldier. That the, that the joy of being a victorious soldier comes in knowing the enemy, and that we do not feel that we're exalting him in any form nor fashion, that we are destroying him and downgrading him. And in this uh, particular lesson that we are studying here on page 66 in your teaching syllabus, it tells you about a man uh, whom the Bible says possessed a minimum of 2,000 entities. That was a Roman legion, and a legion could be anywhere between uh, 2,000 and 5,000 uh, soldiers. We read in Mark chapter 5 and verse 9, and he asked him, what is your name? And the man answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, I presume he did address the spirit. If the man was insane, uh, with the power of the Spirit, there would be nothing else to address except the Spirit. But Christ merely said, what is your name? And they had concocted the word legion, had taken it out of the, out of the Roman uh, army uh, living and just wanted him to know that we, that we are many. And so this demoniac uh, of Gadara seems, as far as we can tell, to hold first place, and then if there's any honor in that, uh, in the number of alien entities to possess one person. Uh, his people in Gadara believed uh, that the man was possessed. They could not, they, they could not help him. The, the local people uh, found him to be strange and, and, and found that uh, he was wild and uh, discovered that they could not tame him in, in any way. And they tried to bind him, but they couldn't hold him. And he would take off his clothes. He would spend time living in the, in the cemeteries on tombs, screaming and cutting himself with sharp stones. And uh, they were all afraid of him, and he stayed away from the human population. Jesus arrived in that land by, by, by divine decree. He had to pass that way. How many are glad for that? Yeah, he had to pass that way. And so he came by divine, divine decree. There, there were 10 of these, these cities in, in Gadara there. And, and so uh, he came and, and brought his boat, boat to land, and this screaming uh, demoniac, in, in, in demonic fury, rushed to where Jesus was. And for the first time in his whole existence, uh, he met a master. <laughs> Isn't that something? He had never met a person that, that startled him until he, his eyes met the master. A and he, 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 he realized that he had met one stronger and greater than he is. So this demoniac uh, recognized Jesus and his authority, and the anger within his heart, and the fearful spirit that was within, within him, says, what do I have to do with thee? Torment me not. And, and uh, this was that spirit speaking from him. It wasn't the man speaking yet. The man could not speak in his own mind until after he was set free. And so the demoniac confesses, you know, the number that was there. Now, this reveals to us something very remarkable in that uh, a spirit does not uh, need a physical territory, you know. Uh, a person can have many spirits within them and, and manifesting through them, and it does not take up any part of the organic being inside, in, inside of you. A, a spirit uh, do, does not need physical territory within inside of you. So if one gets in you, you're not full. 
You see, and here was a man that had a, a minimum of 2,000 within him, at, that, that according to his confession. And, and yet there was plenty of room for more if he had wanted to, to take them in. And Jesus spoke, not to the man yet, he still spoke to the spirit and says, come out of the man. So he was addressing the spirits. He says, you unclean spirit. Ah, uh, there could have been a lot of different kinds of spirits there because according to our, to, to our ability to understand, uh, no demon spirit uh, manifests itself in two ways. Uh, a, a deaf spirit cannot be a dumb spirit. Uh, it only can be a deaf spirit. Uh, and, and so uh, there were 2,000 of these entities doing 2,000 different uh, corruptible uh, situations in this man's life, destroying him. What a mess and what a mess of, of them. But when Jesus said, uh, come out of him, uh, instantly the thing, you know, rent his body, let him fall to the ground, and the man was free. In Mark 5 and 19, it says, how be it Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, uh, go home to thy, uh, thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and that thou hast had compassion upon thee. This man was so set free, he sat at the feet of Jesus, and, and, and then he said, I want to go with you and be a disciple. And Jesus saw the wisdom of him going back to his own people rather than following him off somewhere else. It is so easy when God does something great for you to want to run to China to tell it. It's better to tell your family first. And it's better to tell your neighbors first. They know you and they know your need and they know what's happened to you and they are better able to appreciate and to understand. And also it's a stronger thing for you to set the house in order where you are. So he sent him back, it says, to his own home and to his own friends. That's what it says in Mark 5, 19. Go to your home and your friends and tell them how great things God has done for you and had compassion upon you. And Mark 5 and 20, the next verse says, And he departed and published in all Decapolis. There were ten of those towns, as I told you. How great things Jesus had done for him and how all men did, did marvel. Now, you will discover that Jesus fed multitudes at two ends of the lake. At the north end of the lake, uh, he fed 4,000 people, maybe besides the women and children. At the south end of the lake, he fed 5,000 uh, men plus the women and the children. That happens to be where this man lived, and he was the one that gathered them together. When he told him to go back and tell his friends, he told them that were friendly and unfriendly. And he just kept on telling them that when Jesus got back, he had one of the biggest crowds he'd ever seen uh, confronting him there. And he preached to them and talked to them, and finally he had to feed them. And then he got on the boat and left, as, as, we, as we know. Today, men, women, boys and girls in our land and over the world are tormented by, by alien entities. The, the, the medical world, to be honest with you, is frustrated, and also the psychological world. Uh, the domestic world, uh, would, would, would misjudge them and, uh, and, and, you know, and hurt them. Uh, there are people that are lonely. There are people that have no friends. They don't feel they have friends. And, and there are people that have lost hope. And the only hope that can be offered them is the same that Jesus gave this man. He set him free by his mighty power. And, and he that did it does do it and will do it. You, you can set a person with many spirits in them free as quickly and as easily as one spirit. You do not have to stand. He did not stand and call out uh, 2,000 spirits one at a time and taking him a day and a night. Are you here or not? Amen. All right. He did it all in two seconds. Bing. And the man was free. The whole mess left at one time. And they said, we don't know where to go. Uh, we don't know where to go. Uh, can we go into these pigs over here? You know, they just assumed to be in a pig as you. Okay, and, and, and the pigs, unlike the man, couldn't stand it, and they decided they'd rather be dead, and so they went and drowned themselves in order not to have devils in them. And you couldn't, you, and, and don't go around saying pigs have devils in them, all the pigs that had devils in them died. Well, anyway. <laughs> what a mighty deliverance the Lord Jesus gave uh, to that man, and uh, the, the, the great truths are this, that a man can accumulate evil spirits within him, and they do not take up room in a physical world like you're maybe thinking about. 
and that these spirits can all be driven out with one breath, one power, one anointing of God. They can all be gone. The man can be clean, forever clean, and that man can go and witness for Jesus. Now, that's a great truth that he wishes to give you. On page 68, uh, you have uh, a further a story of a similar nature, but not quite as great, and it's a woman. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 9, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. I wouldn't want to belabor uh, this point. When I talked to the witch doctor in Africa last year, I said, uh, there are a lot of witch doctors? And he said, yes. I said, are there more male or more female witch doctors? He said, the witch doctors are overwhelmingly female and not male. And I said, why? He said, it is easier for them to touch the demonic forces than it is a man. They can release themselves to the devil so much easier. And he was surrounded there. I didn't see another male. He was surrounded there with women. He had a whole camp there where he was the chief witch doctor of that area. I had a, an article that I almost brought with me to class tonight uh, regarding feminine, feminine uh, possessions. And, and it was explaining, now this was a, not a religious thing, it, it was it was in the, it was just an article in a magazine. We understand that in, in Philadelphia alone, there are, there are 3,000 witches, and, and most of them are, 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 are women. You say, Brother Summer, why would that be? I have only one explanation. The devil hates Eve because she produced the Messiah that stepped on his head and he is still angry about the whole thing and wants to hurt her and destroy her in every way that he possibly can. Maybe on the side of the Lord Jesus, those that received him the best in his lifetime were also ladies. And the one who was the first one to the tomb was a lady. And the first one who preached the resurrection was a lady. And she preached it to some apostles that didn't believe. And they got a good rebuking for not believing. Yeah, our folks on satellite, we do have some ladies here. Uh, and that's quite all right, too. You better believe it. Uh, here, 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 here was a person named Mary. When you go with me to the Holy Land, we take you by Magdala every time. There's no city there now. But it's on the north part of the Sea of Galilee and just a little to west, not directly north, it's north and west by the side of the Sea of Galilee where, where Mary lived in the town of, of Magdala. There's only ruins there at the present time. But this woman, in some way, which we don't know, uh, that she found, she found that she could contact evil spirits. And so in Luke's Gospel 8 and 2 it says, and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. You said, what were those devils that she had? Possibly rebellion. Uh, when you see a child or a woman getting rebellious, they're getting ready for possession. Rebellion is a spirit, you see. And once rebellion gets in you, uh, it never stops. It rebel against parents, then it will rebel at school, then it will rebel against the local policeman, and, and it, it will rebel against the man that's, that's over them in the prison where they've gone to jail. Uh, uh, when a spirit of rebellion uh, uh, comes into you, it has to be cast out or it rebels against anything, everything. There is nothing that it will not rebel against because it is a spirit of rebellion. And unless it is cast out, it stays. She could have had a spirit of anger. 
Uh, that she stayed angry all the time, just angry, angry, angry. And one people said, well, Mary, why are you angry all the time? I'm just angry, I'm angry, angry, angry. You see, there are people like that. They stay angry about it. There's nothing they're not angry about because there's a spirit of anger. It could be a spirit of lust very easily uh, because uh, uh, no, no doubt she was an adulteress and, and possibly dealt in harlotry. And so a spirit of lust was in her. Likely a spirit of hate, just hate, hate, hate. Hate everybody and hate everything, you see. Hate is a spirit. People that hate are possessed. People that are loved, they're possessed from up there and not down there. And, and it, it is a great possession. It could be a spirit of pride and very likely a spirit of lying where you couldn't get the truth out of her. And a spirit of stealing, stealing things she'd get her hands on. And very likely a spirit of witchcraft. All we know is that the Bible says that she had seven of these unclean spirits within her, that he cast out of her uh, seven devils. When he cast them out of her, in point number four on page 69, she began to follow Jesus. In John 19, 25, there stood up by the cross Jesus, of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. She stuck with him to the cross. She never did leave. She never did quit. She stayed right with him from the time she was set free until he died on the cross. And then uh, in Matthew 27, as we spoke before, and, and many women were beholding afar off which followed Jesus from Galilee, uh, ministering unto him. Among them, which was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. And so, as we also mentioned, uh, she was the first one to the tomb, and she was the first one uh, to receive the message from him that he was risen, and she was the first one to go and to preach it to others. Mary became the first evangelist of the resurrection. Now, we, we accentuate uh, that truth for this one purpose. It don't matter how deep you've gone, it don't matter how many alien entities might have been within you, you can love God, you can love Christ as good as anybody in the world. Uh, you're not a freak, and you're not something, and you're not crazy. You're possessed. And when you're set free, then you're free. And then Jesus loves you as if you had never been possessed. And, and when Jesus cleans you out, you're absolutely and completely clean, and you're beautiful, and he will use you in a very beautiful way. Now, you see the story before your eyes, so you know that I'm telling you the truth. And so when you work with people to set them free, you're to show them these truths, you see. These are the truths you're to tell them about. If we just keep teaching the Word, it's the Word that sets people free. And, and these are the truths of the Master setting people free, the conditions under which He set them free, and how they were used after they were set free. And so these, these are the doctrines that relate to setting people free from alien entities. Now, on your page uh, 71, uh, you have another woman that was involved in this witchcraft. In the book of Acts, chapter 16 and verse 16, and it came to pass that as, as Paul went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met him, which brought her masters much gain. Say much gain. Much gain. There's your problem in this world. Anything is bringing gain. No wonder they write up all these stories, you know, uh, trying to tell you the future. There's much gain behind it. And, and, and your future is not part of the gain. They don't care anything about you at all. It's the gain. It's the dollars that, they're, that, they're, that they are thinking about. So from the beginning of time, uh, there have been persons uh, who felt they had information beyond the normal human mind. And they invariably seek to influence leaders in business, politics, or anyone else. When Joseph went to Egypt, you see, a long, long time ago, Pharaoh had his magicians already at his court telling him what to do and how to do it. This was 1,700 years before Christ, mind you. In Genesis 14, 41 and 8, it came to pass in the morning that, that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. You see, he had magicians. And he had what he called wise men. They thought they knew the future and so forth. And Pharaoh told them the dream, but there was none that could interpret. You see, not, there was not a one of them. When God is moving, the devil can't move. 
The devil cannot pick up God's wagon and push God's wagon around. It takes the power of the Holy Ghost to move that wagon. When Moses was confronted uh, 40 years, I mean, uh, 420 years after that, when Moses confronted Pharaoh uh, some 400 years uh, later in Exodus uh, chapter 7, verse 10, Moses and Aaron went in before Pharaoh as they did it. The Lord had commanded, and Aaron cast on his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants. It became a serpent. And Pharaoh called his wise men and his sorcerers. Now, mind you, this wasn't the same Pharaoh. We're talking about over 400 years later. Over 400 years later. That only teaches you one thing, that when Joseph was alive, they would take his blessing, but they didn't take his God. They didn't stop worshiping the devil. And that's what you and I have to work on. We're not ready to set people free. We're ready to turn their direction from the devil to God. And it's not their physical being we want to see set free. It's their spiritual being that we want to see set free. Now, don't ever get that thing wrong. We're not going around trying to set people free in the flesh. We're trying to set people free on their insides and direct them to Jesus. There's their only hope of salvation. So 400 years later, they, the next Pharaoh, next Pharaoh, next Pharaoh, he still had his wise men, he still had his sorcerers, and he had his magicians. That's verse 11. And, and so they did it in like manner with enchantments. The world hadn't changed much with enchantments. So the king had advisors, magicians, sorcerers, wise men, and all the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto, unto Moses and Aaron, as the Lord had said. The magicians used these enchantments to, to, to match Jehovah's power. The devil will still do that. The devil will still do that. And by the time of the first world empire in Babylon, we're giving you a historical here lineup, that it was flourishing over in the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, uh, uh, you know, a thousand miles away from Egypt, the same demon power had eminence over there. Magicians, wizards were on the payroll of Nebuchadnezzar, the first world emperor. Isn't that amazing? On his payroll, mind you. We hadn't got quite that bad in Washington. We may be leading that way, but not quite yet. They don't have them on the payroll yet. They, 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 we just crossed their hands with, a, with the greenback. Uh, the, the, the king commanded his magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans. The Ch Chaldeans were those wise men. Uh, those men that had, had a, a relationship with the dead, with a familiar spirit, to reveal to him his, his, forgotten, his forgotten dream. And in Daniel 2 and 2, uh, that's what it says. Then the king commanded, and he called the magicians and astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans, to show the king the dream. And they came and stood before the king. Even the devil could not help his own slaves. Isn't that something? When you think the devil knows it all, he don't know it all. And if he knew it all, he'd be talking more. But he don't know it all, but he's listening. And if you tell him something, he'll know it, but otherwise he don't know it all. In verse 5, the king threatened to cut them in pieces and make their houses a dunghill if they didn't tell him. That's in Daniel 2 and 5. The king answered the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me, and if you will not make known to me the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. That was a threat for them. It was Daniel who saved their necks. Isn't that amazing? By revealing the dream to the king, of the image that's made of silver, of gold and silver, brass and iron and clay, representing the total history, the total history of all of the, of the empires. You see, the total history of all of the empires. And so it isn't that you and I have just come up against demon power, and it isn't that Jesus just came up against demon power. Every time man has congregated, the devil comes up to possess people, to destroy people, to cause people to follow him, to, to, to lead them away from the living God in, in order that they might, you know, find another way to heaven. That's what the devil wants them to try to do. And in each time, God will give his servants authority and strength and power that they can direct the course and that they can stand up tall and that they can be victorious. We are not the losers. I wish that we could get that through the mind of the church, or better, through the spirit of the church, and that we are not losers. And also, I'd like for us to, you know, to try to get it through our spirits that this thing hadn't just started, that ever since there has been an empire, the devil has tried to take that empire. I, I have heard that there are more soothsayers 
and more people that are fortune tellers and more people reading crystal balls in Washington, D.C., our national capital, than possibly any other city on the face of this earth. And we understand that these people do not wait to be called, but they call these men in power and say, don't take the plane tomorrow. You'll fall. It'll fall out of the sky. And they get scared and stay home. Then the plane does not fall out of the sky, but they're right back with another one. When it comes the first of the year, magazines are full of what they predict for the whole year. Who wants to know the rest of it? Comes December. And they don't mention about nine-tenths of it that never came to pass. No newspaper carries that story. When God speaks, he is not a liar. When the devil speaks, you can't believe it because he doesn't know what he's talking about anyway. He's only guessing. I'd like for you to know that only God knows the future and only God can speak the future. And God will speak that future through his church and not through demon power. We have the greatest onslaught of demonic forces functioning against our society today than ever before. There are actually people that belong to what they call Satan's church in this country. There are actually evidences that people have offered human sacrifices in our lifetime in this country to the devil. We are needed in the world that we're in today. We are the marching army of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what upsets me more than anything else, I suppose, is that many churches and many Christians and many preachers would not dare come against the devil as a person or to come against his kingdom, or to come against a possessed one and command that they be free. All right. If the devil was working in Egypt, and if he was working in Babylon, and then in Persia, and then with the mythologists of Greece, and with the mythologists of Rome, I want you to know one thing. He hasn't gone out of business. And he hasn't stopped working in high places. But I want to tell you, with the power and the authority of God, and I should say knowledge first, God cannot bless ignorance. God is not ignorant, and God cannot bless ignorance. If you don't know something, you can't do anything. If you don't know you can set somebody free, you cannot set them free. If you don't know possession when you see it, then you cannot set anyone free. And so, with the knowledge of God within us, and then the anointing of God within us and the power of God within us, we can set humanity free. I hope that you've been enlightened by today's teaching series by my father, Dr. Lester Sumrall. So many people have been blessed by his teachings on God's Word. If you are one of those people, I would love to hear from you. Write me at the address on the screen. I am Peter Sumrall, and thank you for watching and supporting LaCie Broadcasting.